this chapter is talking about bioenergetics, which is the energy that biological or living things are going to need to to move. And in order for anything to move, there needs to be some type of energy stored in that material, either it's potential energy or kinetic energy, or in this case, it's caloric energy, calories, and the calories are coming from the the total breakdown and buildup of, of um, substrates. And the substrates that we're talking about in terms of fuel for the human body are carbohydrate, fat, and protein. And each one of these things are very important in and amongst themselves. They have different functions within the, the body. So you have to have some of each of these particular substrates in order to have the correct metabolism or to have the, the en enough nutrition for your body and your tissues to function effectively. So one of the things about carbohydrate, now you see all of these particular diets and some are no carb, low carb, high carb, all carb. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't want to tell you what diet you should be on or whatever. It's not the point. The point is, I think that I just want to give you a little bit of information about each one of these, which will make it so that each one is actually very important and neither one should be skipped or done away with. First of all, your brain uses carbohydrate for fuel. So if you have a low carb diet, what's going to happen is all of your protein is going to be turned to carbs so your brain can function. But if your brain only uses carbohydrate for fuel, I don't know why you would want to have a diet that doesn't have any carbohydrate in it, especially if you're exercising. Now, for the most part, 50% of the country doesn't do daily physical activity. So we might want to limit the amount of carbohydrate for those individuals. But we're talking in this chapter about individuals who are doing exercise. So I'm thinking about talking to athletes with this content. So for that, for that, I want athletes to have fuel. And because of that, 50% of the diet for an athlete should be about carbohydrates or should be carbohydrates. Now that doesn't mean that the carbohydrates should be spoonfuls of maple syrup. There's more complex carbohydrates that interact with your body a little bit differently. And we'll talk about that, but about 50% of your diet should be carbohydrate. Now we don't want to eliminate fats from our diet. This is what we started to do like in 1980s because of the ob obesity epidemic. So they started to get rid of fats and low fat this. And um, anyway, they started pumping sugar into the products because getting rid of fat makes stuff taste bad. And so but we don't want to get rid of fat. Fat is something that we don't want to, we don't want to eliminate, especially things like um, high density lipoproteins that you can find in avocado, right? There are high density lipoproteins. And what they do is they clear the blood vessels of low density lipoproteins and arterial sclerotic plaques, all right? All of your cell walls are made of fat. Vitamin, um, vitamins A D, A, D, E, and K cannot be absorbed unless there's fat in the body. Fat is crucial for um, the thermal regulation or the exchange of heat in and out of the body. We don't want to get rid of the fat. Fat is an important fuel at very low intensity exercises too. So we want to have about 30% of the diet is fat, but you don't want to just eat bacon strips you want to know what kind of fats are going to lead to cardiovascular disease and avoid those ones. And then protein. Protein is scaffolding. It's like the metal of a building. It's the, the, the materials uh, of your body are going to be constructed by protein. So you don't want to have no protein in your diet because then your tissues will suffer. But you don't store protein, so you don't need to eat too much of it. And if you eat a lot of protein, it's not necessarily the case that you are going to get big muscles. So that's supposed to be a two, and that's a 20. So about 50% of your diet should be carbs. 30% of the diet should be 
fats and 20% of the diet should be proteins. And now we can get into what each of those are. Now, if you're a high endurance athlete, maybe you bump the carbs to about 55% and drop the protein down to 15%, right? Carbohydrate is gasoline. If you're a high end endurance athlete, you got to have better carbs. You got to have better gasoline. If you can manage the fat intake well, then you'll limit your potential for cardiovascular disease in the future. And if you have the right amount of proteins at the right time, then you can make sure that you can build muscle. And those are all good things. So, so when we're talking about fuel for exercise, we're talking about carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Those are substrates. And how those substrates um, break down and break down into fuel and how those substrates can be built up into other things like ADP, ATP. Um, that is the interaction of two processes, one process called catabolism, and that is the breakdown of things. Well, that's an annoying thing, catabolism, that this thing is here, catabolism. And what catabolism is, is the breakdown of big things to smaller things. So I have like a molecule of carbohydrate, which is C6H1206, C carbon six. So six carbons, C6H12. So there's 12 hydrogens and then there's O6. C6H206, that's a carbohydrate. Now that's a pretty big molecule. And in order for that molecule to be processed by the body, this six carbon molecule needs to be broken in half to these two carbon, uh, two, three carbon molecules, right? Here's one of them up here and here's the other. And these are called pyruvate. And these pyruvate molecules, these three carbon molecules of pyruvate, they can go into the um, Krebs cycle and enter the mitochondria, pyruvate, and result in ATP. So this is an example of a reaction where you have a big molecule of glucose, and that big molecule here is broken down into a smaller molecule so that you can get energy out of it. That's an example of catabolism, the breakdown of something. The opposite of catabolism is anabolism. A and A, and then all of the bullism there. Anabolism, all right? And anabolism is the buildup of uh, molecules from smaller constituents of molecules. So for instance, when you have ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and it's kind of like in your bloodstream. And then you have remnants of broken down ATP and other phosphates that are in the bloodstream. They can combine two smaller molecules. They can combine to make one bigger molecule and recycle themselves to make more ATP. So this would be an example of two smaller molecules combining and becoming one bigger molecule. And that would be an example of a buildup of something, anabolism. So you have the breakdown of your carbohydrates to give you energy, and you have the buildup of broken down pieces of energy. And the meta, M-E-T-A, metabolism, the meta part, meta metabolism is, is M-E-T-A means like a, a, a collection of, or a complete um, array of, or understanding of all of the bolisms, all of the catabolism and abolism put together is metabolism. So bioenergetics is the understanding of how these interplay. By the way, feel free to interrupt me at any time. So 
the fuels that we're going to be talking about are carbohydrate, fat, and protein. And now what we need to do is how much of each of these substrates is necessary um, and why. We'll have to talk about that. But ultimately, each of these substrates is eventually going to break down into adenosine triphosphate. And adenosine triphosphate is a molecule that has an adenine group, and then it has three phosphate groups next to it. And the phosphates are held to the adenine group by chemical bonds. All right, so you have your adenine group, and then you have your phosphates. Why does it have this strike through thing? That is an annoyance. And you have these phosphates. And then in order for these phosphates or there, these phosphates are held to this adenine group. And then when the phosphate is ripped off, the energy that is in this bond is used. It's like released. The energy is released. And where is the energy released? Well, remember, you have the actin and the myosin. So you have these cross bridges, right? These things here, the sliding filament theory. And at the very end of one of these things, you had the, the little cross bridge, right? So you have your myelin cross bridge. And remember, with enough energy, that cross bridge slides in that direction and it pulls the Z disks in this direction or that it makes a contraction. Well, the, the energy required to take that myelin cross bridge and move it from this direction to this direction is the energy that is released from here. So this energy released from here is, is like me pulling back the elastic band and the motion that occurs from this stored energy and the resultant release of it is the movement of these um, cross bridges. So all of this stuff breaks down to ATP which re releases energy and allows for your muscles to contract. And that's not just your skeletal muscles, that's your cardiac muscles, that's all of it. That's how your body uses energy, all right? So so we're spending energy, Right, a calorie is just another way of saying energy. And there's other forms of energy. There's light energy and sound and heat. And really what we're, what we're doing, and remember we have these action potentials where the brain is sending these action potentials and they're in the source of electrical energy. We, we don't plug ourselves in into batteries, you know? So we're getting electricity from somewhere. This action potential is being generated from somewhere. Like the building that is the electrical, um, the electrical department in a, in a town, that building doesn't make the electricity. Usually the electricity is from like a dam or something like that. And then they, they wire in the electricity into this particular housing facility, which is the electrical department but the electrical department isn't necessarily where the electricity is made, is made. It's just transferred and stored here. So you could think of the electricity is like the food that you're eating. And that food is in the form of a banana. You know, like you can't, I can't light a banana on fire and use it to do anything like, but if I can transfer the banana into these calories, this caloric energy, then I can, my body can use it. And then I, I'm not sure what the brain does in this whole hierarchy thing, but I think what the brain does is this. I think it just stores the energy, houses it so it can be used later. How it does it, I have no idea. All right, but so that's, that's all the theoretical part. Anyway, you're transferring food, the things that you're eating to this stuff called caloric energy. And even though it's a little bit dis, like distracting, Usually in the nomenclature, they use these terms calorie and cal and all of that stuff a little bit interchangeably. And it's sometimes confusing. But for the most part, anytime you hear about calorie, they're actually talking about a thousand calories, but it's actually one kilocalorie. But then instead of calling it a lowercase cal, they call a cal one calorie and make a capital C. It makes no sense to me. I have no idea what they're talking about. So just be aware that 
when you're looking at research and stuff, it's sometimes a little bit difficult to understand exactly what they're talking about. But for the most part, individuals need about 2,000 calories a day. Now, I don't remember. Julia, it's only because you're on the screen. Just thumbs up. Did we do that little calculator, that, um, that calorie calculator with you to show you how many calories everybody should be at about? I'm pretty sure we did that. Flips should be about like 33,000. Did we do that with you guys? Do you remember that? All right, so we did that. And we did the calorie calculator. And I'm pretty sure that that calculator showed that we should be at about 2,000 calories. Now that's just to function every day not including our activities of daily living, which for flips and other people who are doing exercise and sports and stuff will increase the energy demands above 2000 calories. But for the most part, the average individual and a lot of these dietary um, advice or suggestions or dietary intake values are based on the average 2000 calorie diet. All right, so your body needs calories for a couple of things. It needs calories to support its basal metabolic rate, its BMR. Now, the basal metabolic rate is the absolute lowest number of calories that your body needs to burn in order to just function. So like if you laid down in a bed and did nothing and you were fasting for an entire day, your body would still be spending energy, right? Because your heart is beating, your lungs are expanding and contracting. So your, your eyes are still moving. So your body, everybody's BMR is about, and this is very general, it's not everybody's, but everybody's BMR is about 1500 calories, you know, give and take. So that means if you're not eating 1500 calories a day, you're not even bringing enough calories in to support the very least amount of energy your body needs. And if your body doesn't have enough calories, it's not gonna just, it, eventually what it'll do is just wither away and die. But like in the acute moment, your body's not gonna wither and weigh away and die if it doesn't get the 1500 calories. It's just gonna get the calories from somewhere else and it's gonna get it from your protein. And that's the last thing that somebody who's doing exercise wants is to use their own muscle mass for fuel, right? So you don't wanna have less than 1500 calories, especially if you're doing exercise, because then what you're doing is you're eating your own tissues for food. So, I mean, we gotta at least be at 2000 calories and of the 2000 calories, half of that 2000 calories should be carbs. So now, in the next couple of slides, we'll have to talk about what that means. And if this is like surprising to anybody or anything, let me know. But let's go take a look at types of carbs and the impact of those. All right. So we're going to be talking about these three substrates a little bit more in depth. Now, each of these fuels, carbohydrate, protein, and fat, Conveniently, they all break down into just these three molecules, except for protein. Protein has this nitrogen group on it. So in order to even use protein as fuel, the body has to remove this nitrogen from the protein, and that actually costs the body energy. So the body doesn't want to spend energy to use energy. So the body is very reluctant to use protein as a fuel. And therefore, any extra protein is usually just urinated out. So you don't need to overload protein. There's no, like people have heard of carbohydrate loading, but there's no protein loading. You don't need to do that. So your body definitely needs to have carbohydrate. And if it doesn't have carbohydrate and you have a low carb diet or one of these like um, Vinny from uh, Jersey Shore, if you have his diet, then like eventually all of this protein is broken down amino acids and amino acids are all going to be 
transferred either to sugars through a process called gluconeogenesis, or what it's going to do is it's going to be um, broken down into ATP and energy in the Krebs cycle. Ultimately, all of these fuels get broken down into the same thing, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and that's used for ATP. Your brain needs carbohydrate, so you have to have some carbohydrate. And at rest and very, very um, low intensity exercise, you use predominantly 50% fat and 50% carbohydrate. That's what you're using at rest. So to have no carbohydrate in a diet doesn't make sense to me particularly because you use carbohydrate as your fuel when you're resting. So when you're in class and you're having a hard time paying attention, to me, it's not because you're, air quotes, tired. To me, it's because potentially your brain doesn't have enough fuel. So give it a little bit of carbohydrate. All right. So to me, when the when you're tired in the back of class, my suggestion is just drink a little orange juice, not coffee. Coffee is a different thing. That's an artificial stimulant of your heart. So once the stimulant goes away, your brain still is tired. So to me, I would suggest drinking a little bit of orange juice in the morning as opposed to having coffee. I mean, but what what doesn't matter now? There is many different types of carbohydrates, and they're based on how complicated the molecule is. So you have some uh, molecules of carbohydrate that it's just a simple single molecule. That's glucose, C6H12O6, one molecule, done. Now, one cool thing about glucose is this is the molecule that your brain uses for energy. So if you have a low carb diet, fine, I get you. But ultimately, all of the protein that you're eating, not all of it, but some of it has to be transferred or changed into glucose before it can be used by the, by the brain. So if you have a no carb diet, some of the protein is being changed to carb anyway. It's so like it's a no carb diet is a carb diet. It's just you're getting carbs from somewhere else. So it doesn't doesn't make any sense. Now, we have to keep eating because we can't store too much glucose in your body. So you can only store about 2,500 kilocalories, which is why every day you got to re-up that 2,500 kilocalories. But like it says, it's the primary substrate for your muscles and your brain. So I don't know why if you're an, if you're an athlete, you would want to have no carbs. Any extra glucose, glucose is like, it's, it's Bitcoin for the body. You don't want to get rid of it. Your body doesn't want to get rid of it. Any extra glucose is going to be stored in your muscles or your liver. And if there's excess glucose after that, the liver is going to try to switch that glucose into adipose fat. That's where adipose fat comes from. It doesn't come from fat in food. Cardiovascular disease and lack of exercise comes from fat in food. The fat around your organs, that comes from the fat in food. But adipose fat is stored carbohydrate. Okay? Now, if you can't process the glucose, there's too much glucose in the bloodstream. And the liver just can't process it fast enough. And the pancreas can't release enough insulin to attach to all the glucose and send it to the muscles. Or if I just have no muscle for the glucose to go to, like I'm, I'm not exercising, I'm frail, my, my muscle mass is down. If I just keep eating Twinkie after Twinkie after Twinkie, like where is the sugar going to go? It's not going to go anywhere. It's going to stay in your bloodstream. And when your sugar starts to stay in your bloodstream, it's going to destroy your blood vessels and your nerves, and that's type 2 diabetes. Now, type 2 diabetes comes from there is too much glucose in the blood, and the pancreas can't work hard enough to get insulin 
to process this glucose. So the pancreas works harder and harder and harder and harder and harder and pumps out more and more insulin. But like every drug, there are receptors for insulin in the body and in your muscle cells. And eventually the body is going to become desensitized to that insulin and need more and need more and need more to process the same amount of glucose. And eventually your body becomes desensitized to the insulin and or your pancreas just cannot keep up with the demand and starts to either break down or just can't keep up with it. And that's type two diabetes. All right, now glycogen is the storage form of glucose. So if glucose is gonna be stored for a long period of time, it'll be switched by your liver to glycogen and that'll get stored in your muscle cells and in your liver. But again, there is not much of that, so you have to keep eating. And then this glycogen can be converted back and forth to glucose when needed. Now, when you're exercising, it's not necessarily only important to maintain the amount of glucose and sugars in your body now, you want to make sure that you can maintain these glycogen stores because when these glycogen stores start to really deplete, then your athletes really start to suffer, really start to get tired. So for me in the gym where we have three, four hour practices and we're there five days a week, I want to make sure that my athletes glycogen stores don't decrease incrementally as the week starts, uh, you know, to commence. So what I do is I have them do Gatorade, uh, drink Gatorade during practice. So during practice, their glucose levels are dropping, 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 but then I give them a little bit of glucose in their Gatorade and then it drops and drops a little bit. And then uh, another 45 minutes later, I have them go have a little bit of glucose and Gatorade. And so eventually what I, what my goal is through the course of a uh, practice or a workout or even a week is although I am burning glucose, I'm um, replacing it so that the overall glucose levels over the course of the week can be maintained. You know, now I'm not measuring glucose levels of any of my kids, but this is theoretically what I'm trying to do. And for me, I can't do strength and conditioning with all the kids. Because there's some kids who just are not eating these 2,500 calories a day. They don't have enough poker chips to play the game. So then if I go and have them do strength and conditioning and spend another 500 calories on top of what they're already doing, and they're at school and rushed for practice and rushed for eating, and there's not really good options, and nobody's watching what anybody's eating. So mostly these kids who are eating in school probably eating not good food for themselves. I loved zebra cakes when I was in high school. So I think that what we have to do is, I think of uh, like calories as poker chips. If a kid doesn't have enough poker chips, then I got to think about doing something aside from strength and conditioning, something that is no energy, not spending any energy at all, like meditation. And try to learn through meditation, try to learn through not spending any energy at all, but if I know there are kids who are eating and I, I talk to them in practice, I'm like, how are you eating? What are you eating at lunch? Oh, turkey sandwich, lots of rice, lots of pasta. Okay, no problem. You have enough carbohydrate, enough fuel to do strength and conditioning and make sure your glycogen stores don't deplete and make sure that we're not using protein for fuel. So it's all this like kind of like combined effort thing. All right, let's, let's erase some of this stuff and get back to the carbohydrate. There are some carbohydrates that are super simple. Then there's other carbohydrates that are like, you know, molecules of carbohydrate. And then there's other molecules that are like huge, long chains, long, 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 like hundreds of sugars long, packed all in tight to each other. All right. And very dense. And you would imagine that if I take one of these molecules and I put this molecule in my bloodstream, it's so simple that this molecule of carbohydrate is going to be absorbed into my bloodstream almost instantaneously. 
This is something like glucose. All right, glucose is the simplest carbohydrate. So you could go to CVS and you could go get glucose tablets and you could crush them up and mix them in water. And you could just drink water that has glucose mixed in it. It would just dissolve right away. That's just sugar water. Now you drink that sugar water, that doesn't need to be digested. It gets into your bloodstream and it's almost immediately starts to get absorbed. There's nothing to break down. Now, the more complicated the carbohydrate gets, the more processing the carbohydrate needs in order to be used for fuel, right? And if it takes more processing, it's gonna spend more time in the stomach and in the small intestines. So this, this is, let's say this is kind of like um, a starch, like pasta. This is like pasta or potatoes or like um, flour or maybe even like fruit, fructose, like the sugars and fruits. All right, we'll even write fruits. That's just sugar, but it's more complicated. It's more complex sugars. So those sugars take a little bit more time to break down in the bloodstream. Then you have other, other um, carbohydrates like fiber, fiber. And I'll give you a couple of other examples of carbohydrate like quinoa, rice, oatmeal, wheat. All that stuff is, it's all corn, potatoes. All that stuff is just carbohydrate. It's just so complexly packed that it takes a lot more time for that to break down once it gets into your blood, into your stomach. So imagine if you had, for instance, that 2,500 calories. Now, back in the day when humans were hunter gatherers, this 2,500 calories, we didn't know when this 2,500 calories was gonna come around. You know, you're walking in the savanna. You know, you don't know where there's going to be this cache of food or calories. But nowadays we have a supermarket. I can get 2,500 dollars, 2,500 calories in one shake from Dairy Queen. You know, whenever I want. So this 2,500 calories is kind of easy for us to get these days. But we don't want to just eat 2,500 calories worth of stuff. For instance. I could eat 2,500 calories worth of table sugar. And that would absolutely give me the energy, the 2,500 calories, the fuel that I need to run my body. It would work. The problem is, is there's no nutrients there, no nutrition. So eventually, like all of the vitamins you would need would deplete and your tissues would break down. But other than that, this 2,500 calories is dumped into the system immediately, all at once. Within seconds, that 2,500 calories of sugar, of straight table sugar that you just ate, is now immediately absorbed into the bloodstream. So within seconds, your pancreas has to release enough insulin to deal with all of it, all of it right now. And because of it, if you take a look at your like insulin response, this is a graph, the insulin response would be like this. At first, there's no insulin response, no insulin response. And then this is the moment right here where I'm eating the 2,500 calories. There's no insulin response. And then all of a sudden, oh my God, 2,500 calories of food, of carbohydrate just went in and my, my pancreas is going to have a huge release of insulin and that's going to dissipate in the bloodstream for a period of time, right? So this response of insulin has to be incredibly high and fast and dump a huge amount of insulin into the bloodstream all at once. And then 
all of the insulin attaches to all of the glucose and the body's like, I don't know what to do this. What am I going to do with it? What do you want me to do with it? Right? So it takes all of the sugar and brings it to the liver and the liver has to process it. Immediately it turns it all to fat if you're not exercising. So most people are sitting next to a computer for 12 hours a day and they just drank. Okay. Now this, this is a little, they just drank a Gatorade. Where's the sugar going to go? They're sitting behind a screen. It's not going anywhere. It's going to go into their body. They're going to use some of it for heart rate and all that stuff, but the rest is just going to get stored. That's why 50% of the country, we want to limit their carbohydrates because 50% of the country doesn't do any activity to burn the fuel. So everybody just stockpiles it. But if they were exercising, then I would say 50% fuel, but not just table sugar. So if I have pasta or fruit, there's like, there's structure to it. So I could have an, a glass of apple juice, or I could have an apple. I don't know how to draw an apple, I don't think. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. So if I have a glass of apple juice, the apple has already been processed for me. It's just in juice form. I put it into my stomach. It's immediately absorbed, almost immediately. Like when you drink orange juice, it's so fine and so processed that as soon as it goes into my mouth and I swallow it, I feel that rush of energy. It's almost immediately absorbed. But if I have an apple, the apple breaks down over time. So let's say I have, uh, I don't know how many calories is in each of this, probably 25 calories. Let's say 25 calories in this glass of um, uh, apple juice and 25 calories in this apple. For an athlete, this 25 calories is going to last a lot longer than this 25 calories. This 25 calories is going to get into your bloodstream now, immediately, and it's going to be used now. But this 25 calories is going to give you energy for a longer period of time because it takes time to break down. And because it takes time to break down, the insulin response to break down the apple is going to be much less it doesn't need to re release so much insulin all at once, and it's going to last a little bit longer, but the insulin response is less. This food here has a huge insulin response, and therefore this food, these foods here, are known to have high glycemic indexes. They make the glycemic index, the amount of sugar in your bloodstream go up very quickly and the response has to be a very high response or an immediately you know uh um, um strong response whatever you call it of the pancreas to get out enough insulin these foods would be low glycemic index foods this is high glycemic this is low glycemic so to me if i was a diabetic or if I wanted to control my glucose levels, what I would do is I would have an apple and a glass of water as opposed to the apple juice. Like give, give your kids or your nieces or your nephews a glass of water and an apple as opposed to the apple juice itself, right? Have a glass of water and an orange as opposed to the orange juice itself That'll last for a longer period of time. It'll save your pancreas over the long run. But all of these things are, are carbohydrates. And think about the things that we sell in our country. Wheat, corn, rice, pasta, potatoes, Coca-Cola, all of the stuff that we sell, not all, but a huge amount of our agriculture is carbohydrate. So we're not going to get rid of carbohydrate in our foods because our gross domestic product and our, the amount of money that our country makes has a lot to do with carbohydrate. So what they do is they just change the name and they don't call it sugar. They call it something else like high fructose corn syrup or whatever else they're going to call it. But
right? Our country is going to put carbohydrate and stuff because that's what we grow. So we can't get rid of it. We just have to understand the impact of it. So what you could do is you could take a, a bowl of oatmeal and you could have that particular carbohydrate. The oatmeal is going to break down over a long period of time, a long period of time. It's a low glycemic index food. It's going to give you that 2,500 calories over a long period of time. But in that oatmeal, you could also put a little bit of um, fruit. And now the fruit is going to break down a little bit quicker than the oatmeal. It's going to give you energy for, you know, a little bit. And then eventually it'll get broken down, but you'll still have the residual oatmeal energy left. And in this bowl of oatmeal with fruit, you can put a little bit of honey. And now what you're doing is putting another layer of carbohydrate so you'll get energy quick the honey will burn off quick then the energy from the apple will still be available the apple will start to burn away but then you'll still have the result the the residual energy from the from the oatmeal so what you're doing is you're layering the carbohydrates you're making all different glycemic indexes of carbohydrate within one meal so that you're spacing out the release of the energy. So if I was going to, like for the ladies, if you're playing lacrosse and you've got a long game, three to five hours before you play, three to five hours, you should be having a meal that is pretty rich in carbohydrate. Man, that'll give you some gasoline for your games. You won't get tired. Layer your foods get energy for the long haul, but also energy for the first quarter of the game. This will give you energy for like the middle portion of the game and the oatmeal will make it so that you still have calories that haven't been totally burned and stored, all right, by eating just straight table sugar. All right, anybody have any questions about all this stuff? It's kind of cool because this lecture is completely different than the lecture that I did on this on YouTube. So it'll give you more info. All right, let's get rid of this stuff. All right, one of the other things is your body doesn't want to store things as carbohydrate because carbohydrate can only store a certain amount of calories per gram. So if I give you a gram of carbohydrate, maybe I give you just a, uh, I don't know, a gram is probably just a, a what is that, a, a sugar cube. I can, I can find out how much energy is in that sugar cube by putting it in something called a calorimeter. And I don't have to get into a, what a calorimeter is too much. Actually, I think that we talk about it later. Calorimeter, calorie meter, calorimeter. And really what a calorimeter is, is um, it's like a crock pot, honestly, now that I think about it. It's uh, like a chamber. It has a top to it. It's like this, this, and you put the sugar cube at the bottom of the chamber. And then around the chamber is this like a gasket that has water and the water surrounds the chamber it's like a little gasket and in that gasket is water and then that water has a thermometer in it and that thermometer goes to a computer whatever and they seal this this up nice and tight put the top on and they burn this sugar cube they light it on fire and that is going to release some heat and that heat is going to increase the temperature of this water and that's how they actually find out how many calories all of the food that you eat has 
right? So when you go to my fitness pal app, then you see that uh, some amount of chicken has this many calories. That's how they know. They actually do that. Now, when you burn a gram of carbohydrate, it releases a certain number of calories, four calories. So if you could store lots of these sugar cubes next to each other, you'd store more and more calories that you could use later, that's adipose fat. But it's actually not the whole story because adipose fat is not carbohydrate, it's fat. And fat is kind of interesting. Why wouldn't the body store carbohydrate? Why would it switch carbohydrate to fat? Well, if I look at fat and how much energy you can store in a gram of fat, you can store much more energy. So you can store 9.4 kilocalories as opposed to only four in carbohydrate. And if I show you here real quick, protein, again, you can only store four calories per gram of protein. So your body doesn't store protein. It doesn't store carbohydrate as protein because you, protein isn't a good storage medium, but fat is a really good storage like uh, uh, medium. So your body switches any excess carbohydrate to adipose fat. And you saw before, we can't really store too much carbohydrate in the body, less than 2,500 calories but you can store unlimited amounts of fat on the body. There's unlimited. Now, so why wouldn't the body use fat as a fuel if you can store more of it on the body? Well, because it takes a long time to break down the fat. Like it takes, it's, it takes a long time for me to even like get the olive oil off of my like frying pan. You know, so fat, it takes a long time to get out of your stomach, to get into your bloodstream, to break it down, to, to break apart all the lipid molecules and all that stuff. So it takes time. And therefore, if I need energy now, but fat takes a long time to break down to give me energy, then my body just can't use it, doesn't want to use it because it takes a long time. So it does make a lot of ATP, but it's very slow. And not only that, in order to break down fat and use it as fuel, it needs to be broken down to free fatty acids, which are like the broken apart pieces of fat, but you need oxygen to do that. So like you can't use fat if you're swimming underwater for, you know, 30 seconds. There's no oxygen there. So it, it's limited. It's a great storage um, substrate. And it's a pretty good fuel substrate, but not as good as carbohydrate. No idea what this is. Uh, this shows you how much of each of these substrates is stored in your body. So like we said before, you can see that in your liver, your liver is storing some glycogen. Glycogen is glucose that's been switched to like this storage form, all right? In your liver, there's a little bit of glycogen, about 450 kilocalories. 450 kilocalories is enough for like two hours of walking on a treadmill at three and a half miles an hour, not a lot. Then you got muscle glycogen. And remember, we have about 2,000 calories needed for your basal metabolic rate. And this is enough to get you to hunt and gather some food. So you have enough stored in your body to be able to function on a daily basis. And then if I drink and eat carbohydrates during exercise, I'm going to have a little bit of glucose in my bloodstream and some glucose in other body fluids, but you can't store a huge amount of calories with carbohydrate. So the body just says, all right, we'll switch it to fat. And now you can see how many calories is stored as fat 
huge. So it's clear and uh, why wouldn't the body switch sugars to fat, but it's not fat that's making people fat. It's sugar that's making people fat and the lack of exercise potentially. And that's not necessarily the, the it is sugars. And it's not lack of exercise that's making people fat. It's the sugar. Because sugar is a drug. And when sugar gets into your brain, just like other drugs influence your brain, when sugar gets to your, your brain, or particularly when insulin gets to your brain, it tells your brain two things. Like, if I'm a lion and I come up to some prey, there are, and, the, and the lion starts to eat the meat, there are chemical reactions that happen immediately when that lion starts to eat the meat, right? There are, there are um, metabolisms and catabolisms that start to occur. And one of them is in the brain, there's a mechanism that as soon as the lion starts to eat, there's a mechanism in the brain that says, whoa, don't stop eating, dude. You don't know when you're gonna get food again. So don't stop eating. Like a lion never eats a dollop of food. They eat the whole thing. They gorge. They eat as much as they can. It's because there's a mechanism in the lion's brain that tells it, when you find food, keep eating. You don't know when you're going to get that food again. There's also a mechanism in that brain that as soon as the lion is done eating the food, and it now has a big cache of energy, it doesn't want to spend the energy right away. So usually what happens is the lion will sleep for like 18 hours and store the energy. So that's what happens naturally when we also get food. But right now the food paradigm for us is so changed compared to what it would have been if we were like, you know, wild animals. We have food everywhere, anytime you want it. But our, our evolution hasn't caught up to that yet. So we still have the same mechanism sort of that that lion does. Like, you know, when you're at Thanksgiving and you eat the turkey, like it's so good. I eat a lot of turkey. And then at the end of eating turkey, I want to take a nap. That's because of chemistry. Or when I'm eating candy corn, I love it. It's so good, but I cannot, I can never have like four pieces or like Oreos. I can't have two, you know, like, and then, so what happens is when sugar gets to your brain, it tells your brain to keep eating the sugar, right? Because just like the lion, I don't know when I'm going to come up to calories again. So there's a mechanism in my brain that says, oh my God, sugar, insulin gets to your brain and says, ooh, that's a cache of calories. Uh, keep eating that, keep eating that. So we, we blame a couple of behaviors for people being obese and the behaviors that we, hey, Chris, can you tell that guy in the background to like not come in the shot, dude? Okay. Thanks. I was just kidding. I was a, just a total joke, by the way. And the only reason I did that is because I knew that if I asked Chris that question, then Chris would come on to the mic. I knew it. So what I did is I created Chris's behavior. I gave the cue and Chris did it on my cue. So that was an external thing causing a behavior. That was just an example of it. Now, here's another behavior. Eating too much. That's a behavior. But oftentimes, behaviors are caused by things like advertisement external cues, money, time, laws, all of this stuff. So you can't blame the obesity epidemic on a behavior. And that behavior being eating too much because that behavior could be caused by something else. And in this case, the behavior of eating too much is a biochemical reaction that happens in people's brains when insulin gets into your brain. Now, Every drug and every medication, every chemistry of every individual is different. So that craving to eat more once you start eating sugars might be more or less for other people. But for me, when I start eating candy corn, 
and I, the sugar gets into my system. It's so powerful that like I could put the candy corn on the other side of the room and I'm looking at, I'm like, I'll just have two more. I'll just have two more, two or three more, two or three more gets to the point. I got to take like elastics and put it around the candy corn. That's not because I'm weak. That's because that's not because I don't have enough willpower. That's not because I'm delinquent in my behavior and I want to keep eating. That keep eating behavior is caused by the sugar itself getting into my bloodstream and the insulin affecting my brain and saying, hey, man, now when we're hunter gatherers, there's no candy corn anywhere. You know what I mean? So your body's biochemistry hasn't caught up to the fact that we have candy corn now. Anybody watch alone, you know, that's kind of like what we're used to. Little bits of food every once in a while, not supermarkets. So the behavior of eating a lot is caused by something, and that something is sugar. And we started putting sugar into foods in the 80s because we started taking the fat out because we thought it was the fat that's making us fat. Right, so it's this whole like conundrum here. But what they're gonna do is they're gonna tell you though, they're gonna deflect. So let's keep going, one, one second. Not only, not only does the sugar and insulin get to your brain and tell you to eat more food, it also causes a, like a lethargy, right? As soon as the lion eats the food, as soon as you eat the turkey, you wanna take a nap. That's a mechanism to store the energy, which makes sense, right? And that, that means taking a nap is like not exercising. So like if I eat candy corn and I can't stop eating it, and then afterwards I lay down on the couch, which I always do, you have like that, that pass out crash after eating like, you know, cheesecake or whatever, you know, dessert you're going to have. That, that go to sleep laziness, that's not you being lazy. That's a biochemical interaction of sugar in the brain. And when that happens, it causes you to want to store the energy and be less physically active. But those are two behaviors, eating too much and not exercising. Those are two behaviors that we contribute to the obesity epidemic. And that I feel bad, you know, about myself sometimes. So there is an emotional attachment to these behaviors that we may blame people for, you know, obesity because of these particular behaviors. But like I was able to create the behavior with Chris, maybe sugar or advertisement or other things can create the behavior of eating or not exercising. So educating people in regards to what sugar does, how it relates to obesity, but how it also relates to proper brain functioning, right? These things are very, very interrelated, right? So you can get doctorates in nutrition and, you know, all of this stuff. It's, it's super, super interesting to me. All right, let's move on. Anybody have any questions? All right, I'm assuming that it's okay. All right, let's clear all this stuff and keep nine slides in this one. No idea what time is. Anybody, what time is it? Hold on. I just can't move this over. No, oh, so much time. Love it. All right, let's go. Next slide. So now, if you have no energy, if you have no calories, if you have no fuel, it's like if DJ and I are at like a party and we're like um, at, a, at a barbecue and there's a bonfire, if there's no more wood and DJ and I are not done at the, the bonfire and we're allowed to throw other things into the bonfire, I'm sure we would. Chairs, cans, whatever is there. You know what I mean? If we can. So your body is the same way. If you don't have any carbohydrate or fat because you're an endurance runner and your body composition is 4.2% and all of the fat needs to go to making um, 
uh, cellular walls. It could be the case that you don't have, you know, really too much fat or carbohydrate to use. So you're going to use protein as a substrate. But it's only during starvation. So you don't want to really be using protein as a substrate. In fact, if you do have protein or too much protein in your urine, it's an indicator that you're eating too much protein. Right, so you just drinking too many like protein shakes or whatever, or it's an indicator that you're not uh, you're not processing um, energy effectively. And in any event, the protein is going to get broken down into glucose anyway. So to have a no carb diet to me is is sort of like just um, vernacularly is not correct because ultimately you, you have to have carbohydrate. It's just the protein is going to break down into different parts and it's going to create sugar. Gluco is sugar. Neo is new and Genesis is creation. So when you break down protein into amino acids, there are like bits and pieces of those amino acids like floating around the bloodstream. And eventually what happens is those will all go to the liver and the liver will make all of those little bits and pieces of protein and fat and stuff. They'll recreate it. They'll put the carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens together and create sugar. So protein is going to get broken down into amino acids and get broken down into sugar anyway. All right, again, you can't really store too much energy in protein. So your body doesn't cash or or hold on to excess protein. Um, protein can also be turned into free fatty acids if there's not enough sugars. So if you notice here, so you, you're gonna either be ingesting triglycerides, which are fats that have a three glycerides on them. It's like you have this backbone, fat kind of looks like this. Let me know. This is just a drawing. I don't think fat looks like this, but whatever. it's this glycerol backbone. And then you have these glycerides. It's like, and then in order for the fat to be utilized, these glycerides need to be ripped off of this backbone here. And that's what happens with um, beta oxidation. So these fats are broken apart. And then these free fatty acids, this would be a free fatty acid, it's broken down to free fatty acids. And those free, free fatty acids and this glycerol, this is a glycerol, a glycerol, and then three fatty acids. That's what a fat is. Um, then that is going to go into the free fatty acid pool. So in your bloodstream, there's like free fatty acids that are floating around. Some of those free fatty acids are going to go to fat stores. And these fat stores like adipose fat or fat in your body can be broken down. Anytime you see all assists, let's, let's pull this up a little bit. One second. Anytime you see this word lysis, it means ripping apart. Like when you had uh, your cell and then your cell cleaved and then it ripped apart and you had the mitosis and stuff, that's lysing of the cell. So lipolysis is the breaking apart of a fat, right? Lysis, right? Glycogen, glycogen is the storage form of glucose. So glycogen O lysis is when glycogen is broken down back into glucose so it could be used for energy, right? This is glycogenesis. This is the creation of glycogen from glucose so it can be stored. And then that goes into the glycogen stores. The glycogen be, can be lysed. And so you have this interplay between everything. But, and the reason why this is all possible is because all of this stuff is made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. 
except for protein has that nitrogen group that we talked about. So because everything is made of the, all the same molecules, everything is kind of like interchangeable, which is a great thing. All right, let's get rid of this. All right, let's, let's, let's catch up a little bit. All right, in order for any of these chemicals or any of these substrates to be utilized, there needs to be enzymes. And what enzymes do is they start um, chemical reactions. So there are these enzymes and an enzyme you can tell because they have this ASE suffix at the end. So ATP needs to be broken down, but in order for ATP to get broken down, you need these enzymes. And the enzyme ATPase is helpful in making this into energy. Now, type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers, they have different amounts of these enzymes. And because of that, some of your muscles, your type one muscle fiber types are going to be able to break down ATP differently than type two muscle fiber types. For some athletes, it's not necessarily how strong their muscles are or how big. It could be the case that they just have different enzymatic um, dynamics. And if that's the case, then their ability to create and utilize energy and break down substrates could be better or worse than others. It's not just strength and power though. Uh, what, are we, what are we looking at here? Let's, let's look at this. So when you eat something, when you eat carbohydrate, all right, that fuel is going to be broken down into ATP as long as there are enzymes. All right. Now the ATP has these phosphate groups on it. And every time the ATP is, or the phosphate group is removed from the ATP, there's a release of energy. And that can happen three times for each molecule of ATP. So there is a release of energy, but there's, and that energy, like we said before, is used directly, directly for the changing in the positioning of those cross bridges. There's also a release of heat. Oops. There's also a release of heat with this break, breaking apart of ATP. Not all of the energy that is generated from the breakdown of ATP is utilized by the body. A lot of it is wasted. That's why you shiver. That's what shivering is doing. Shivering is like these micro movements, which are breaking down ATP very quickly. And that ATP is going to the changing in the cross bridges of your muscles. But a lot of the heat is lost. And that heat loss is your body's mechanism of warming up. Chemical reactions occur only when the reacting molecules achieve a sufficient initial energy state to start the reaction. In metabolic pathways that form adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, an input of energy in the form of stored ATP is typically needed to begin the series of reactions that ultimately release energy. One can think of this as priming the pump. Enzymes present in the pathways control the rate of energy production, often speeding up the reaction by lowering the activation energy needed to begin the reaction. 
Biochemical pathways that result in the production of a product from a substrate typically involve multiple steps. Each individual step is typically catalyzed by a specific enzyme. As fuels are subsequently degraded into byproducts along the metabolic pathway, ATP is formed. Utilization of the stored ATP results in the release of usable energy, heat, and the release of adenosine diphosphate, or ADP, and inorganic phosphate. Enzymes can be inhibited through negative feedback of subsequent pathway byproducts, slowing the overall rate of the reaction. This usually involves a particular enzyme located early in the pathway called a rate-limiting enzyme. That is a smart guy right there. I couldn't have said it better myself. Let's see what this guy has to say. He's ready to go. During exercise, there are a number of processes involved in muscle contraction that are critically dependent on the continual supply of ATP. And the production of ATP from the various metabolic processes and the energy pathways is exquisitely sensitive to a number of changes within the muscle. Increases in calcium, which occur during muscle contraction and in increase to a greater extent with, with greater intensity of exercise will stimulate many of those pathways as do the breakdown products of ATP, ADP, inorganic phosphate, AMP. And they activate many of the enzymes that are involved in the breakdown of creatine phosphate, breakdown of glycogen, and the breakdown of fatty acids. Those um, signals also activate a number of kinases which are involved in the, the long-term adaptation of muscle to regular exercise. Fantastic. All right, so ATP breaks down into ADP plus your free phosphate, your um, inorganic phosphate plus energy. And that's the energy used by your muscles. But this, all, this is all dependent upon this process called hydrolysis, where water is broken apart and the hydrolysis and the enzyme ATPase all make it so that ATP can break down. ATP can break down, uh, which is one of the reasons why you get thirsty when you're exercising, right? You're breaking apart water to process ATP so that you can get energy, but now you need to replace the water. So, um, and, and that's not the only reason, but that is an amount. Now you don't have enough ATP to do exercise for a long period of time. You only have enough ATP in your body. I think it's like for 10 seconds or so. Anyway, what we need to do is we need to find a different way to create ATP because we don't have enough in our bodies. How do we do that? Well, one way that we do that is, and one unique way that we can do that on this planet is by using oxygen, and carbohydrate. Now it used to be the case that, you know, we were slime molds and then like these little like uh, amoebas and things. Eventually those amoebas started to get the uh, like gill slits and started to use oxygen. And they used oxygen because you can use oxygen to create more energy. That's the whole benefit of having oxygen on this planet. Then those animals were able to use oxygen for fuel but they could only get so much fuel out of the oxygen. So those animals started to use their environment and eat other animals. And then instead of eating other animals, at some point they realized that if they eat these things here, wheat, fruit, all that other stuff, you can create a lot more or you can create ATP as well. So our, our like, living beings and organisms on this planet are functional for the very re for, because of the fact that there's oxygen and carbohydrates like like the chicken and the egg 
So in order for us to, we need water. It's a good thing that there's water on the planet for this all to happen as well. Right? These are like these kind of things that are happening to put all the pieces together. Now, not only, so this is the breakdown of ATP. This would be the catabolism of ATP, but you can also recycle ATP from broken parts of ATP. So when I do this process, boom, and I break down the ATP, there's going to be ADP, and I can do this process again, and then there's AMP, adenos and monophosphate, and then there's these phosphate groups that are just like kind of floating around the bloodstream, and these little pieces can be recycled and put back together, right? The ADP and extra phosphates, as long as I have energy, can be put together into more ATP. Now, this is one of the things that I manipulate because in gymnastics, my kids don't do activity for longer than 70 seconds. It's the longest that they're gonna be on floor. So in gymnastics, we are never using long-term endurance. We're never lose, using slow glycolysis, the slow breakdown of carbohydrate. In gymnastics, we're really only using ATP. So for my guys, it doesn't make sense for me to work their cardiovascular system so that they can go on long runs. It makes more sense that I can get them to recycle this ATP faster and faster. One second, I'm gonna sneeze. <coughs> oh, geez, Louise. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Sir. So what I want is for my athletes to be able to work at the like one minute level. Um, one of the ladies who does lacrosse, how long does a, uh, how long does a shift last for? You play the whole game? Yeah, all right, I'm assuming you play the whole game. Then. Um, but Flips, Flips plays football. And Flips says he's a cornerback or safety. Hopefully he's a good one because we need them. But Flips is never running all out for 35 minutes in a row, like the ladies from lacrosse. So I don't know if Flips needs to be running for 35 minutes in a row. Flips is usually working at 10 to 15 second bursts of speed. And then he goes back to the line and rests and might even come out of the game and go back into the game once he has rest. So what Flips is doing is he's working at 10 to 30 seconds of energy at a time. Just like my guys in the gym. So what I would do for endurance training for these guys, endurance or for bioenergetic training for my athletes is I want them to try to get better at synthesizing ATP. So for instance, what I do is I'll have my guys do battle ropes one minute of battle ropes. And in that one minute, I'm encouraging them to go all out effort, 100% effort. And they're literally doing this, breaking all of their ATP down, all of it. And then at about 45 seconds, you can see they are gassed. They have no more ATP stored in their muscles anymore. I'm literally manipulating this slide on my athletes. I gas them, burn all of the ATP. And you can see as soon as they're done, and I'm going, go, 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 go. You got it, buddy. You got it, buddy. I love you, buddy. You got it, buddy. Like super motivated. And these kids will go crazy, right? And then you can see they're gassed. Obviously, you can imagine what would happen. And how long would it take, do you think, for them to sit there like and pant? Try, and I always have them foam roll or do something like that while they're doing it. But now it's gonna take about five to seven minutes. And at about five minutes, you, they're all like, all right, we're ready to go again. And they're like, you guys are crazy. But at first, if they're not trained, it'll take about seven minutes for them to get ready to go again. All right, what happened in that seven minutes was this. All of the ATP that I destroyed and broke down 
needs to be recycled. And once it's recycled, I can use it again. It's just during the beginning of the summer when we're not doing that battle rope training, they'll be gassed for about five, six, seven minutes. But then the longer and longer we do it, the faster and faster they seem to be ready. I can train them to recycle or to, I can train their phosphorylation cycle. So when my guys do endurance training, I'm not talking about running on a treadmill. I'm talking for gymnastics. I, I have to manipulate that. And if I was working with flips, I would manipulate that. Now, if I, if I was working with the offensive lineman, probably. Now, if I was working with, you know, maybe the wide receivers, they have to run this way and then they get to the line, they go back and they run this way and they go back. And the, so I, but I, I would think that we can manipulate all of these levels. And as a good coach, what you want to do is what, what, where are your athletes getting energy from? And can you manipulate that to make them better athletes? It's not just strength and power. It's manipulating the whole cascade of events so you can get better athletes. So the, now your body doesn't really have a huge amount of ATP stored in it. And a lot of time, this first energy system, was, which is called the phosphagen system, all right, the phosphagen system and I think we talk about this later, phosphogen, because it's phosphorus, and it has to do with phosphorylation. So this phosphogen system is one of the ways that your body can get energy. There's another way, all right? So this is the phosphogen system. Another way is through glycolysis. Now, the phosphagen system is specifically talking about ATP glycolysis, L-Y-S-I-S. Hopefully that's correct. And this glycolysis, there's two different types of glycolysis. There's fast glycolysis and there's slow glycolysis. Fast glycolysis, like it like we said, it happens quickly and it's without oxygen. Oh, darn it. Oh, it screws everything up. Oh man, just give me a second, all right. A good, a good buddy of mine passed away two days ago. Dang it. I mean, if people just call and call and call, there's nothing I can do about it. We'll just have to like do it for the rest of the class, and then uh, just have to be done. I just I don't know how to stop that, but man, where was I? Oh, all right, so we have, um, let's get rid of this stuff here. So there's different ways of getting energy. When we're talking about ATP and the utilization of ATP for energy, we're talking about the phosphagen system. When we're talking about using carbohydrate for fuel, we're talking about glycolysis. Glyco is sugar, lysing is the breaking down of sugar, but there's more to it than that because sugar can be broken down with oxygen and without oxygen. So glycolysis without oxygen is the fast glycolysis. And if the sugar goes into the mitochondria because there is oxygen, then that is known as slow glycolysis because it takes a long time for that to happen. The Krebs cycle takes a long time. But the amount of ATP that you get from the breakdown of sugars with oxygen is much bigger than the phosphogen system, right? You get very little AT energy out of this. Actually, for every molecule of ATP, right, you get one molecule of energy, one to one. 
Now, when you start to use sugars and oxygen, instead of one to one, it comes like one to hundreds. And that's why molecule, uh, that's why animals and living beings started to use oxygen and carbohydrate for fuel. And nowadays we want to say, no, we're going to get out of carbohydrate for fuel and do keto diets and stuff. I mean, the whole reason we're animals is because of carbohydrate. Let's keep moving on. Okay, so what are we looking at here? This is uh, ribo. Oh, this is just saying the same thing. It's the same, the same thing. This is your adenine group. This is your adenosine triphosphate. This is an adenine group. This is ribose. This is your uh, adenosine. And then you have three phosphates held together by energy bonds. When I rip the phosphate off through a process using this enzyme, then I get a release of energy. This energy is used for contractions. It's the same thing over and over and over. We can't store a lot of ATP, so we gotta make ATP from some other way. And like I just said, three ways to make ATP. You have the phosphagen system. You have the recycling of adenosine triphosphate with phosphocreatine. That's why you get creatine monohydrate. And that's why you give creatine monohydrate to people who are gonna do power and anaerobic exercises. All right, but somebody who's doing long distance running doesn't need to have creatine monohydrate because they're using a completely different way of utilizing fuel for energy. I don't want to work my gymnasts here. They don't need to be working there. This is utilizing carbohydrate and oxygen to do bouts of activity that are going to last for two hours straight. Gymnasts don't do that. So if I work my gymnasts, in this particular energy like system where I train that energetics, it's the wrong energetics. If I train the ladies who are doing lacrosse to do this stuff here, it's the wrong energy system. So I'm not helping my athletes. Now, sometimes my athletes will say, hey, but can I run? Is it okay if I run you know, a couple miles? I'll say, yeah, but running a couple miles is gonna work their oxidative system. I would not want them to run a couple miles during the, during the season. It's gonna waste calories. It's gonna take away fat-free mass, muscle mass. I don't want that. So I work my athletes at the ATP system and I'll, we'll, we'll explain how to do that later, all right? So this is how your body is getting energy. There are two ways for your body to get energy that are anaerobic, anaerobic. Anytime you see aerobic, it means oxygen and anaerobic means without oxygen. So if I don't have oxygen, I can still function. Like you can hold your breath right now and stand up and walk around, or you can do a couple of bicep curls. So you're moving, you're utilizing energy, your breath is held. So you don't need oxygen to do that stuff. So this breakdown of ATP doesn't require oxygen, only requires water. But water breaks down into oxygen and hydrogen anyway, so that's where the oxygen is coming from. You also have this glycolytic, the breaking down of sugar system. That's the one that has to do with pyruvate and lactic acid. I don't know if anybody has heard of those two things, but we'll talk about it. This breaking down of sugars is also without oxygen. It happens outside of the mitochondria. This oxidative system implies that you're using now oxygen to create ATP. And once you get oxygen involved, the amount of ATP that you can produce is huge. Much more effective for organisms to utilize oxygen to create energy. That's why this whole planet works. And this oxygen is going to allow for carbohydrate, protein, and fat to get into the mitochondria and break down in the Krebs cycle. I'm sure you guys have heard of the Krebs cycle. I'm not going to ask anybody to rehearse or tell me any of the, the parts of the Krebs cycle for a different class. So this first system, the ATP, the breakdown of phosphocreatine, 
it's only useful for activities that are lasting for about three to 15 seconds. I think that when flips is running a play, 15 seconds is probably the absolute minimum of how long a play would last for. A, a play is never lasting for three seconds. So I would assume that not only is Flips utilizing his ATP system, but he's also probably leaking over into the fast glycolysis as well. You'll notice, remember that equation that I showed you earlier, the one-to-one -one relationship with the ATP phosphocreatin system, only one mole of ATP is created for one mole of phosphocreatin or phosphorus. For the most part, they say this ATP phosphocreatin system, even think of it as not so much for energy, not so much for the breakdown of ATP, but more for the recycling of ATP, the reassembling of ATP once it's been broken down. It's, it's not really being utilized for many activities. I can't think of many activities that we do that are actually less than three to 15 seconds. You know, getting up from a chair or whatever. So most of this ATP phosphocreatin system has to do with this phosphorylation or the, the recycling of ATP. And I'm trying to get my athletes better at recycling ATP. So what I do is I specifically manipulate it. I burn all of the ATP off, I give them rest. And then what happens is their bodies and my athletes will get better and better and better at recycling ATP. Now, when they have a vault, a vault, they run down the vault, they're in warmups of a the meet, they run down the vault, they spend their ATP, that lasts about 15 seconds. Their body has no more ATP, they go to the end of the vault runway, they're tired. All the other kids in their group are now warming up vault and they get back to the beginning of the vault line to do their next warm up about three to five minutes later and their ATP has recycled and they're ready to go for the next vault and they're not tired. Same thing with you flips, like you would get back to the line and you would be more energetic because you would have recycled ATP faster. So for flips, what I would do is I would have him do like battle ropes or burpees or sled pushes, or I'm sure he does that kind of stuff. A lot of this stuff is gonna be things that we're, re we're, we're um, repeating. So in order to create ATP, again, you need some of these enzymes, phosphocreatine and creatine are gonna combine with um, as long as there's energy, they're going to combine with any free phosphorus or ADP that are floating around the bloodstream and create ATP. And that ATP can use energy. It's weird, though, because you need ATP to create ATP. Right? That's why dead people can't like create ATP because they don't have any more ATP green created to create ATP. It's like this recite, it's like a reciprocal thing. All right, let's see. The simplest of the energy systems is the ATP PCR system. This pathway starts with a high energy phosphate molecule called PCR or phosphocreatine. When split, this molecule releases energy and becomes creatine and inorganic phosphate. The inorganic phosphate can combine with ADP to form ATP. The release of energy from the PCR system is catalyzed by the enzyme creatine kinase, which acts on PCR to separate the inorganic phosphate from PCR, forming creatine and releasing energy. The energy released can then be used to add the inorganic phosphate molecule to an ADP molecule, forming ATP. When energy is needed, ATP is split into ADP and inorganic phosphate. The cell can keep ATP available for a short time by breaking down PCR, 
providing energy and inorganic phosphate to reform ATP from ADP. Thank you, thank you, sir. Let's, let's move on. So now we have another system of creating energy. And the, this new system has to do with sugars. The first one didn't have to do with sugars. It was only the ATP stored in your body. But as molecules and organisms got bigger and bigger and needed to fight off of each other, right? We needed more energy to do so. So you need to get more energy. So animals started to try to eat other things. Instead of just utilize the energy that's on their bodies, they started to use um, external sources of food. And the external sources of, of food were sugars and glucoses that are in the environment. I'm talking about slime molds back in the day, right? And they realized that if they used other sources of things for energy, like ate each other or ate other things, that they got more energy, right? If you use sugars, for fuel. Notice here you get two to three moles of ATP for every mole of sugar. So you get two to three times the amount of energy if you burn sugars than you would if you just used the ATP in your body alone. And that's why like organisms went from amoebas to start to kind of like like develop mouth parts because when you can consume something and you can use that thing for energy, then you get more energy than you had before, right? So this whole now transition from ATP to glycogen is contingent upon the fact that on this planet, there are things to eat and there's oxygen again. So this, this, um, this, um, pot is now starting to boil and now organisms can, can get more energy. And if they have more energy, they can get more food. They can, they can, um, get more territory. They can protect themselves. So now molecules are starting to use sugars for fuel. They're getting more moles of ATP. And now I have more ATP. So now I can do things longer. So I would, I would say that probably flips as a wide receiver, uh, sorry, as a uh, cornerback is probably working now 15 seconds to two minutes. Now, I mean, if he's on the field for, you know, three downs in a row, which he probably is, he would be on the field for probably about two minutes. And if he's on for just one play, it's for about 15 seconds. So I, I think that flips is working and, and spending or, or creating energy using this system here. So as his coach, I have to work this system here and get this system here more effective. I have to get him better at breaking down sugars and get the right sugars in him so he can break them down for longer and keep his pancreas healthy and stuff. So this is as his nutrition coach and strength and condition, I would try to figure out how to manipulate this here. So now this system here is, is utilizing glucose, but it's not utilizing ox oxygen. And what happens is right now, glucose is that C6H12O6, a six glucose molecule. And Glucose is going to be switched to a molecule called pyruvate, pyruvate. And what pyruvic acid or pyruvate is, is a, it's pretty much uh, glucose broken in half. It's a three carbon molecule. And that three carbon molecule can now be utilized for ATP. There are a bunch of different steps to that reaction, but now notice here, there's two to three ATPs created for every molecule or amount of glucose, much more than was present in just the muscle. Now, 
all of these reactions occur outside of the um, mitochondria. It's a complicated reaction, so it does take a bit of time, but it's much faster than the next kind of um, energy, which is the oxidative system. The oxidative system is using oxygen now. So this glycogen system, the glycolytic system, it does take a little bit of time for the energy to be created for these ATP molecules to be created from glucose or from glycogen, but it's much faster than that oxidative system. And because of that, they call the glycolytic system is called fast glycolysis, fast glycolysis, the breaking down of sugars fast. All right. The other one is called slow glycolysis. So this oxidative system that I showed you later, that's called slow gly glycolysis. And there, those terms are used somewhat interchangeably. So one of the problems with, with the glycolytic system is that it's relatively low yield of ATP compared to utilizing oxygen. When you look at the oxidative system here, you'll see that for every molecule of free fatty acids, fat for every molecule of fat that you burn, even though your body doesn't burn it as much as sugar, you can get more than a hundred molecules of ATP. And like organisms over a period of time stopped eating, you know, plants and carbohydrate and started eating other organisms and utilizing fat as fuel because you can get a huge amount of energy through oxidizing fat. Look at how much ATP you can create through one mole of glucose using oxygen. So those molecules that started to utilize oxygen and eat things in the environment back in that, like, you know, the mix of uh, the primordial goo, right? What, what happened is those, in, those molecules that could start to utilize oxygen and utilize external sources of energy got more ATP and were able to, um, to do more things, to work more, to, to, to go further, to get more food. All right, so, but that requires oxygen. This does not require oxygen. This is fast glycolysis. And I'll show you just this pathway. It's much easier to explain it this way. Let me erase this. So you'll have a molecule of glucose, a C6H12O6. Then a couple of things happen. I'm not going to ask you any of this stuff ever. People can get doctorates in nutrition and understand all of these. I will never ask you this stuff. Just generally, what's happening? The glucose is being broken down. All right. Their energy is needed. All right. And when the glucose is broken down, there are a couple of different steps that happen. It's broken down into these two pyruvate molecules. So glucose is C6H12O6. C6. Six H12. That's like the molecular formula of glucose. C6H12O6. And that's broken in half through glycolysis. All right. And when it's broken in half, you're left with two, three carbon molecules called pyruvate. Now, that pyruvate if it's going to be broken down outside of the mitochondria, is gonna be switched and converted to lactic acid. But if there's oxygen involved, that pyruvate will connect to the oxygen. It will enter the mitochondria and it will go through the Krebs cycle and then result in a lot more ATP. So Krebs cycle is good, but the problem is, is it takes a long time. It takes a long time to start. Now, let me go back one second. I just wanted to show you that graph. So the problems with the glycolytic system is compared to using oxygen, there's not a lot of 
there's not a lot of ATP. The other con is if there's no oxygen present, then that pyruvate, the pyruvate is going to be converted to something called lactic acid. I'm sure people have heard of lactic acid before. Sometimes they will say that lactic acid causes um, uh, soreness. Well, what actually causes the soreness is this acidic nature of the blood. Because when lactic acid is created, it creates these free hydrogen molecules that float around in the bloodstream. And it's the acidic nature of the blood that's not good for the cells, not the actual lactic acid itself. In fact, if you do a good cool down, then the lactic acid is shuttled out of the muscles back to the liver. And these remnants, because lactic acid is just remnants of glucose, these remnants can go back through that gluco neo genesis, the new creation of glucose and become sugars again. So when my guys are done with their strength and conditioning, immediately I do a five minute cool down of 50% of their act, like of, of intensity. I just have them do jumping jacks, run in place, push up, sit ups, jumping jacks, run in place, push up, sit ups, 20 seconds at a time. We cycle through about three or four times, very, very low effort. And then what you're doing is you're squeezing, like literally squeezing out all of the lactic acid, pushing it into the liver, replacing all that blood with good fresh blood, making all that lactic acid into sugar so they have more fuel. So I think lactic acid is actually a good thing. It's, it's the precursor for newly created sugars. It's just getting rid of it out of the muscles is, is timely. Now, because lactic acid is acidic, like any acid, if I just poured acid on my hand, eventually it would start to break down the tissue. So lactic acid and the acidic nature that it um, creates in the blood is actually somewhat um, um, uh, deleterious. I don't know what, what kind of word is that. Who uses that? Is, is not good for cell walls. All right, so it starts to kind of break down and make it so that the muscle contractions aren't as effective. All right, now, what are, the, what are the cons? I mean, the pros. Well, it allows us to have a lot of energy when there's limited oxygen. So like if, if I needed to swim for longer than 15 seconds underwater and I don't have the ability to break down sugars for fuel, I'm just gonna drown, you know what I mean? So you have to have the ability to not need to use oxygen for fuel. But at the same time, if we can use oxygen for fuel, you get a lot more ATP out of it. So I would bet that flips and the gymnasts are all working at the ATP, phosphocreatine, and glycolytic system. I bet the ladies who are doing the lacrosse, though, I don't know if you have shifts. I think you do. I can't, I, don't, I have no idea. Let's play, let's say soccer. Soccer is definitely way outside of this glycolytic system. So if, if I'm training my athletes and they're soccer players, I gotta, I gotta work on, I gotta work on the oxidative system for sure. I gotta get them to be able to utilize oxygen with, uh, to be able to go through, sorry, to be able to utilize oxygen and create more ATP because they're gonna be doing things that are lasting longer than two to three minutes. Remember, the glycolytic system is only good for about two minutes of maximal exercise. So anything after two minutes, I'm gonna to need to find some other way of utilizing or creating ATP. Oh, well, that's a great thing because now amoeba has not only started to utilize other things and eat other things, but now they're starting to utilize oxygen. Now, when, when the organism started to use the oxygen in the environment, they were able to convert the sugars using that Krebs cycle to even more energy. So now oxygen's involved, and now you can do and get oxygen continuously because we have lungs 
So now you have lungs that can bellow in this oxygen and you got, you got a handful of candy corn that's in your pocket. And now you have energy and ATP, not just for five to 10 seconds of activity, right? But you have energy for, a, you know, the whole day. And now you think about like a, like a, a monkey on the trees, they eat leaves. They're not eating carbohydrate. They don't have energy like we do. So they have to spend a lot of time processing that, that kind of muck in their, in their belly and they don't get a huge amount of ATP. So they're forced to spend a lot of time sleeping. But we have steady supply of oxygen and food everywhere and anywhere. And that allows us to be able to walk. We have so much energy, we don't even think about it anymore. You know, you just have enough. You can use steady supply. You can go, just breathe. Everything's good. Now, this is a, a very complex process. I'm not going to ask you any of the processes. That's for a, 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 a doctorate in nutrition. But it is very complex. So it takes a lot longer. That's why they call it slow glycosis, slow glycolysis, the slow breakdown of sugars for energy. And that occurs in the mitochondria itself, not in the, the, the cytoplasm or the cell fluid itself. This happens in the mitochondria. And in the mitochondria, there's the, a couple of things. First, the glycolysis happens, the breakdown of the sugar into the pyruvate. But then that pyruvate gets into the um, inner cell walls of the mitochondria and goes through the Krebs cycle. And then part of the Krebs cycle is this electron transport chain. And honestly, I can't even explain it to you. So I'm not going to ask you to explain it to me. All right. But so here's the breakdown of glucose into the two pyruvates. And then there's a release of carbon dioxide and then NADH. These go to the, see, the, the electron transport chain. And then here's, here's something that's relatively important. Before anything, before the glucose can go or the pyruvate can go into the mitochondria and go through the Krebs cycle, it, it gets broken down into these two acetyl-CoA molecules. And just remember that acetyl-CoA because eventually fat and protein are all going to be broken down into acetyl-CoA. And remember, carbohydrate, protein, and fat are all carbons, hydrogens, and oxygen. So it makes sense that they would all break down to this common substrate, and they do. This is like the key, the link between all of them. Eventually, carbohydrate, protein, fat, they're all going to break down into acetyl-CoA and go through this exact same process. All right, so I don't, I don't understand a no carb or a yes carb or a this carb or a not carb or I, I don't understand diet. I, what I understand is that your brain needs carbohydrate to function, your body needs protein to keep its tissues going, and your body needs fat so it can have cells and you know, maintain its temperature. And then you need vitamins and minerals to make sure everything is functioning. Now, you need to be able to understand how many calories you're bringing in and be very, very careful at recording that and how many calories you're spending in order to understand weight management. But I think, I think that all of this is important. And when you're holding back one substrate or one you know, piece of the puzzle. It's like saying, I'm going to make chocolate chip cookies, but I'm going to leave the baking soda out. You know, like it's, it's not, you have to put all of it together. It's not to say that the carbohydrate is more important than the protein or the fat. They're all part of it. All right. So remember, glycolysis can occur with or without oxygen. And in this situation, we're talking about the utilization of oxygen for fuel. So let's go here. All right, so one molecule of glucose is going to break down into those two pyruvates. And eventually, that one molecule is going to be two pyruvates. And the two pyruvates, one each, is going to make into an acetyl-CoA then the acetyl-CoA is going to go all through this trick. I mean, I'm not going to ask you to understand all of this stuff. Another interesting thing about the Krebs cycle is for somehow, all right, when the Krebs cycle happens, it starts with acetyl-CoA. It goes all the way through the Krebs cycle, 
releases all of these ions, see NAD plus ion and another plus ion. So these are all electrons, positively charged electrons that are going through this electron transport chain that releases a huge amount of energy. And it goes through this whole process, all of these ACEs and ACEs and these enzymes and all of this stuff, it releases water, it causes, and then eventually it ends up as, look at it, it says ox, uh, oxaloacetate, but this turns back into acetyl-CoA. It's like weird, it kind of all the way around and turns back into the very thing that, it, that started in the first place. So acetyl-CoA is important, all right, just remember that. Then a lot of the ATP production happens in the electron transport chain where these molecules of NADH that have these electrons that are attached to them are, are combined with oxygen and all this other stuff and make ATP. But I'm not going to ask you anything about that. The only thing that you want to know is that for oxidation, utilizing oxygen and sugar, one glucose yields 32 ATPs. And remember that glucose is stored in your muscle and in your liver as glycogen. And because the glucose needs like one extra step to break down, it requires an ATP to utilize. So for every molecule of glucose, you get 32 ATPs. But if you use muscle glycogen and liver glycogen, it's actually even more efficient. You get 33 ATP molecules. So obviously utilizing oxygen and sugars in our environment have been good things for, um, have been good things for um, organelles. And that's why, um, that's why living beings are flourishing on this environment, on this planet. All right, what do I got here? This is going through the same thing that we just said. You have glucose comes in, it gets broken down with a bunch of enzymes, requires energy for that to happen breaks down into two pyruvates. Those pyruvates are broken into acetyl-CoA. They go through the Krebs cycle and along the Krebs cycle, a bunch of different steps. There's uh, five ATPs created on this cycle and this cycle. And there's a total of 32 ATPs created for every molecule of glucose. I bet the next slide is gonna say the same thing. Uh, I mean, it's gonna say it better than I say it, so. The net production of ATP from substrate level phosphorylation in the glycolytic pathway results in a net gain of two ATPs. Three ATPs may be produced if glycogen was the starting point. In the presence of oxygen, an additional 28 ATPs can be generated from the electron transport chain. A total of 10 NADH molecules leading into the electron transport chain, two in glycolysis, two in the conversion of pyruvic acid to acetyl-CoA, and six in the Krebs cycle yields 25 net ATP molecules. The two FAD molecules in the Krebs cycle result in the three additional net ATPs from the electron chain. And finally, substrate level phosphorylation within the Krebs cycle involving the molecule GTP has another two ATP molecules. The net result of full oxidation of a molecule of glucose is the generation of 32 ATPs. Honestly, gibberish to me. Anybody, can anybody explain what he just said? I'm just, it's kind of a joke, but like, uh, honestly, I don't know all of everything. I only know the stuff that I know, and I'm never going to expect you to know everything either. Right? So, all right, here we go. Where are we? Now, the oxidation of fat, not only can we use oxygen to break down sugars, but then organelles started to eat each other and they realized that they could get even more energy, right? Three to four times more ATP than glucose. So you'd say, well, why don't we utilize it? Well, because it's much slower than the burning of sugars for fuel. It has to go through this beta oxidation, the beta oxidation of fat. And fat is that, remember I said it has that glycerol molecule. It has like that glycerol backbone and then the three fatty acids 
the tri fatty acids on the glycerol, triglycerol, these have to be removed. And that is a process. And that has to happen before you go into the Krebs cycle. All right. And it requires energy. It requires two ATP. So to use fat as a fuel, it spends fuel. And there's a lot of steps depending upon how complicated the fatty acid is. Right now, it does require oxygen now, but it, there's a lot of ATP yield later. All right, so your body does process fat. And in fact, if you are a very highly trained endurance athlete, what happens is your body starts to get better at stockpiling muscle glycogen and storing muscle glycogen. Sorry, I'm just doodling for some reason. Um, it, it, has, um, it gets better and better at stockpiling and utilizing the carbohydrate later during the end of the run, during the end of the endurance effort, and at the beginning of the effort and at less lower intensities, the body gets better and better at utilizing fat. So one of the results of endurance training is, um, is, is a better ability to utilize fat over a period of time. Anybody have any question at any time? I, I just, I'll, I'll, I don't mind doing this and I, I, it's fun for me. So if you want to interrupt me at any time, let me know. I don't even know if anybody's sleeping. Or... So one of the cool things about the oxidation of fat and protein and carbohydrate is again, everything ultimately breaks down into acetyl-CoA. And then that goes into the Krebs cycle. And it's the exact same thing that happens with glucose oxidation. So again, I, like everything breaks down into acetyl-CoA, everything. So saying no carbs and no protein and no this or no that, it, to me, it, everything is going breaking down into the same thing. So it might, it, you may as well make a good and a healthy um, ratio of each of the nutrients so that you can get the right recipe made and get the right muscles built when you need them. It's not just one or the other, all right? But the path is very similar. But you can see some, some um, oils and some fatty acids yield huge amounts of ATP for one molecule of, of the substrate. So this palmitic acid is incredibly um, good at storing energy. So, but we don't use fats because it takes a long time and a lot more energy to utilize fats as energy. But if you don't have enough carbohydrate, then fat is a good fuel. All right, it's not a bad fuel at all, and you can store a lot of it on your body. All right, just talked about the same thing. Now, protein, rarely used as a substrate, only when you're starving. But again, it's going to be converted to glucose anyway through gluconeogenesis, or it's going to ultimately be broken down into amino acids and eventually to acetyl-CoA. But your body doesn't want to use it because it has this nitrogen molecule on it that you've got to rip off. So before you're able to even use protein as a fuel, it requires energy. So your body doesn't want to do it. And even if your body does oxidate and utilize protein, the amount that it um, contributes to our overall metabolism, the amount that, of energy that you gain is minimal. So usually we just ignore the energy that is um, coming from protein. Now, if energy is coming from protein, it's bad because you're not giving yourself enough fuel. You're not getting to your 2,500 calories a day. And if that's the case, then you're getting fuel from protein, but the protein is fat-free mass and fat-free mass is the very thing that we're trying to build up, right? So we don't, we don't want to use our fat-free mass as fuel. Um, I also said that, remember, you can use the lactate that you create um, through your fast glycolysis processes as fuel. The lactate can go back into the muscle fiber and oxidize and created um, back into glucose through gluconeogenesis. So that's another source of fuel. That's four fuel sources. Now, I think it's important for me to understand where my athlete lies in this bioenergetic continuum and appropriately 
assign activities to make these systems more powerful uh, and more effective. And you can do that. That's that's what we're doing burpees for and manipulating all of these things. That's what that's what's happening. All right, where are we at? Seven slides. Now, most activities are a combination of each of these energy systems. It's just we have to we have to figure out. It's like you say you have a football team. A football team has all sorts of different athletes and needs. So if that's the case, I would probably have different bioenergetic training strategies for different groups of players on the team for sure. You know, or I would think about if I was going to do um, athletes in the gym who are doing strength and conditioning, they would, I would have to, I would have to give them um, a much different suggestions in regards to nutrition. Um, later on in the semester though, we'll, I'll, I'll show you a couple of documents that I think make things really easy and helpful. So I'm not just giving you all of this information, but we can make it practical. Uh, let's see where else, what else we got here. Oh, we talked about this. I mean, this is pretty much, I wish they would just give these tables and not give the chapter because it's pretty much the whole chapter on one table, right? The ATP system, no oxygen necessary. It's um, uh, changing phosphocreatine to creatine and back and forth, all right? There's um, relatively little ATP formed and you can do things for about less than 15 seconds. So you think about your athlete less than 15 seconds, gymnastics, vault, my athletes have to be good at this. This is about a minute long, a minute. No, nothing in gymnastics lasts longer than a minute. So for me to be working at this more than about 90 minutes, this is crazy. So I want my athletes to train here, but the lacrosse game is probably more like this. So I want my lacrosse athletes to work here. I want my long distance trainers to do here. And as a coach, I have to learn how do I train bioenergetics? I would do here um, uh, battle ropes. I would do here probably high intensity interval training, or I would do something like circuit training. Over here, I would have you do um, I don't know, running, running or whatever is healthy. I don't even think running is healthy for knees and things like that. So I would probably do something different. 